probably oh, it wasn't huge, but it was a big for uh, for us. We never lived in the country before, so it looked for like a really big backyard. We were going to turn his big backyard into a garden because we watched some movie. Maybe some of you guys have seen this movie. It's called Back to Eden, and it's about gardening. And we just thought this is amazing. And so we went outside and we examined the soil in James's backyard. Now James lived in a subdivision in Clovis, California, and uh, in California. They don't do uh, these, these crawl space kind of houses. They do on a slab foundation, which means the, the lot has to be steamrolled. And so they had steamrolled apparently the entire lot, not just where the house was. Because when we went out to look at the soil to see where we could garden, we examined it and we said, well, this, is, this is some pretty hard soil. <laughs> what are we going to do? And we ended up, we wanted to plant some fruit trees and we wanted to plant, uh, you know, Swiss chard and all kinds of other good, yummy. I say that because that's still to this day, that Swiss chard is like going like gangbusters in this garden. And these fruit trees are still there, but we had to do some things to the soil in order to get it to be really usable. And those who have gardened before know that typically soil doesn't just happen, not good garden soil. Good garden soil needs to be tended and needs to be looked after and needs to be amended sometimes. And in this particular uh, application, we had to, we did a couple of things, but in, for the trees, I don't know if any of you have ever uh, read Ellen White's uh, idea of how to plant a fruit tree. It's very interesting. Did you know that she claimed, she said that an angel told her how to plant a fruit tree. <laughs> it was very interesting. We actually did it that way which by the way is really hard because you have to dig a three foot hole and three feet deep kind of thing. It's a huge hole and we didn't have any augers or anything. We're just doing it with shovels and it was a lot of fun, but guess what? That, that dirt is really, really hard to dig in. And that was, that was quite a lesson in itself. And then we had to, then we, then we were trying to plant stuff in the soil and it's just not, anytime you try and put a, a seed in it, it's not going anywhere. So we actually had soil delivered we had to get the soil from somewhere else. Kind of interesting idea, right? The good soil came from elsewhere. And we had to change this whole garden to be something different than what it was. It needed transformation. And, you know, what we're going to be studying today is related to our verse in Hosea about breaking up the fallow ground because now it is time to seek the Lord. And it is in this parable of the sower that Jesus gives us the ideas of these four soils we were just singing about. Thank you for singing with us. And we are going to look at that together to find out really these very important uh, spiritual, the spiritual symbolism of this, this parable. Now, uh, the first time I think I ever heard about it, the parable of the sower I thought Jesus was talking about somebody who was fixing clothes. So if you thought that when you heard about the parable of the sower, don't worry, a sower is somebody who, who sit, casts out seeds. I only really understood more about a sower when I lived in Nebraska. Because in Nebraska, there, uh, right on top of the Capitol building, there's a picture, or not picture, a big statue of a guy with a bunch of seed in his like shirt or whatever it is and he is sowing the seed because you know it's kind of a big deal in the midwest to go and plant things like wheat and corn and all that good stuff but jesus as well in the midwest he would have uh, not in the midwest sorry <laughs> he is out in the uh what do you call that <laughs> out out in the uh the country of israel not in the midwest he was out there and he would have seen also people out in the country sowing seeds. This is how they, they lived, right? They needed to do this. They counted on the crops to produce. And he would have seen this. Now, it's very funny, I guess, as Jesus was talking to these people, that he, he told them a story of something they're literally probably seeing right, right next to them. But there's some differences in his story. So I want us to go there. To We're going to read the version in Mark chapter 4. So if you're in, uh, you have your Bible with you or your cell phone or whatever it may be, go ahead and go to Mark chapter 4. 
This story is in all three of the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, but we're going to read the Mark version today. And let's start there in verse three. Here's what it says. Listen, behold, there went out a sower to sow, and it came to pass as he sowed that some fell by the wayside, and the fowls of the air came and devoured it up. And some fell on the stony ground where it had not much earth, and immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. And then some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no fruit. But still others fell on good ground and did yield fruit that sprang up and increased. And some brought forth 30, some 60, and some a hundredfold. It's an interesting, interesting parable, but I gather as people were listening to it, they're even watching the guy over there. They're kind of like, I mean, who really sows seeds among thorns? And, and you wouldn't try to throw it on the path or on stony ground that hasn't been prepared. So Jesus has got to be saying something more. But what is he saying? And it's clear from our context that the disciples, at least, were just baffled. They're like, I have no idea what he's talking about. He's sowing seeds. What is he? I thought we were like he's the Messiah. He's, now he's a gardener. What's happening? So they actually come to him and they say, hey, we don't, we don't get it. And the most amazing thing happens right here that I just want you to don't miss this. They don't understand. And they go and ask Jesus. And Jesus says, yeah, come here, come close. I'll teach you. Let me help open your understanding so that you too may receive the word of God into your heart. This is a really important idea. You know, in John chapter 7 and verse 17, Jesus said that you, uh, you shall, if anybody wants to know his will, he shall know concerning the doctrine whether it is of God. This is really important that if we want to know, we go to Jesus and we say, hey, I want to know. And he, what do you think he's going to say? He's not going to turn you away. He's not going to say, oh, no, that's only for, uh, that's only for, you know, those people up there on the hill at the Polsbo Seventh-day Adventist Church. He's going to welcome you and through his Holy Spirit, open the word of God to your life. It's very, very encouraging that Jesus wants you to know what God's word means. Now, as he begins, he is going to kind of just make this as plain as can be. And he's going to just explain to them all the different parts of the, of, of the story and the symbols. So we're going to look at those as well. And the first element that we're going to look at as we are uh, still there in Mark is in chapter 14. And it says the sower sows. What's he sowing? He was sowing seeds a minute ago, but now it says that the seed is actually the, the word. The sower sows the word. In fact, if you were to look at the parallel verse there in Luke 11, it says very plainly that the seed is the word of God, which interestingly enough, Jesus is God and he's here sowing. He's, say, he's spreading broadcast. That is this word that's available to everyone. And he says, this is the seed. It's the word of God. And so as they're hearing the seed is literally being cast out into the, and all these different places. And, and it's really important that we understand that this seed, this seed is available to everyone. That's, I believe, one of the reasons why he talked about these four different soils. And obviously, this, the seed was the same. The sower was the same. Only the fact that this, the, the soil itself was different is what yielded different results. But the good news is that if you ever, as we're going through this, find yourself identifying with one of the poorer soils, the good news is soil can be amended. Soil can be transformed. And the soil, even the thorny soil, can become good soil. It's a very encouraging thought. You see, Jesus, as a sovereign of heaven, he had come to proclaim the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And he's sowing that seed at this very moment. The problem had been, in many cases, that the people that he was talking to, they had also received a different kind of seed. 
See, the people of his day had all different kinds of interpretations of the Bible. And they had also been sowing, as it were, these ideas in people's minds. And so they had presented the Messiah as not a, a, a person who would come and save them from their sins, who would provide salvation through his substitutionary death, but rather they had presented him as a, a conquering king. And so they constantly were coming to him saying, well, show us that you've got the power to do this. And despite the fact, I mean, literally, they had myriad miracles to look at and see that Jesus did, in fact, have power. And yet they continually were pressing him because the people had all these mixed up ideas. Now, what this story tells us, and I love this idea, is that Jesus had not come to conquer, but to sow seeds of truth in men's heart. In men's hearts, truth needs to find a root. If that doesn't happen, the conquering king doesn't have a kingdom to rule over, which is why he came first to sow the seed so that he would have a crop to actually come and reap it someday. That's in Revelation chapter 14, right? When he checks the grain to see if it's ripe. And finally, then he can come and gather it into his barn. But if he didn't do any sowing in the first place, then there wouldn't be a crop to reap. But Jesus had looked at, at, at these people and he'd seen that they had all these misinterpretations. And he told them things like, you search the scriptures because in them you think you find life, but these are they which speak of, of me. All the scriptures that he had hoped that they would turn their hearts to him to receive him into their, their lives, they had instead twisted through some misinterpretation of scripture. Friends, I would invite you again, if you ever are wondering, what does scripture mean? What does this mean to me? How do I apply this to my life? Where should you go for your understanding? You go to Jesus. You say, Jesus, please send your Holy Spirit to help me to understand. I'm not getting it. And you know what he's going to say? Absolutely. Yes, I would love to help you because he wants to save you. And it is imperative that his word find a place in your heart. <clears throat> now, it's very interesting as well. The same line, the same idea of thought. I, I saw it in a, favorite, in, a, in a line of the chapter in uh, Christ's Object Lessons. It's really one of my favorite thoughts in that chapter because it, it seems so applicable for us right now. Here's what it says. Christ had come not as king, but as a sower, not for the overthrow of kingdoms, but for the scattering of seed, not to point his followers to earthly triumphs and national greatness, but to a harvest to be gathered after patient toil and through losses and disappointment. I think last week's sermon covered this a little bit too. It's not about national greatness. It's not about building an earthly kingdom. That's not why Jesus came. And so it's very interesting for me to look at kind of the direction of much of Christianity, especially in America sometimes, when we seem to be more interested in earthly kingdom building and not so much in focusing on that heavenly kingdom, in turning our hearts and our minds away from this world and to the coming world. You see, we even sometimes, even if we aren't involved in politics maybe and, and building a, a political kingdom, sometimes we're even involved in, say, building our own Family kingdom. We say, oh, I, I want to get some property in the country. Nothing wrong with that, by the way. But I want to get some property in the country, and I want to build a, a nice little farm, and I want to, I want to have uh, some fruit trees, and I want to have... And you, start, and you could, if you weren't careful, you could get so wrapped up in wanting to build something here that you lose focus on the coming kingdom. Now, you could... You could because I just said the country house, because that's what we're thinking about right now. But it could be something different for you. It could be something completely different. Whatever the case may be, it shouldn't draw your heart away from the word of God. That is the key. That is the key. And so they come and they ask him, tell us about it. And he says, well, the, yeah, the seed is the word of God. So who's the sower? Well, the Bible makes it very clear that the sower is somebody who is casting out the word of God, right? Now, contextually, 
Very specifically, we know that this is Jesus in this case, right? He's the one who is bringing the word of God, who's explaining it, who every time somebody comes to him and says, teacher, what do you say about this? He says, well, what does the word of God say? It is written that, you know, he keeps pointing them back to the Bible. And friends, this is something we can do as well. You and I can also be sowers of God's word. And this is something we need to make sure that we are, we are trying to do again and again, looking for those opportunities. Jesus, in this parable, showed that he wanted to do this sowing in a broadcast manner. It wasn't necessarily only to be one seed at a time, which means we ought to have some way to have a broadcast method of sowing the word of God, sending it out amongst all different kinds of people because it wasn't just the good soil that received the seed. You understand? Jesus wanted to get it out to everybody. So in our sowing of the word of God, do you know, I, I read somewhere that we could, we could send that we could put out pamphlets like the, uh, like the leaves of autumn, you know what I mean? Just like where there's, whoosh, and the chances are pretty good that some people who get those, are going to react like the good soil. And some like this, and some like this, and some like You understand? Everybody who receives these things reacts differently, and yet that doesn't mean that we don't present it. We must present it to everyone God gives us an opportunity to. And I know that sometimes it's scary. I know we don't know, maybe we're, we're worried about how to do it. I'd love to have maybe some afternoon uh, classes in the future where we can practice. How do I talk to somebody about this kind of thing? What do I say? What, what, if they, what if they don't like what I say? What if they ask me questions? All these things are things that people have told me for why it is not something they regularly do of, of sowing seed as they go about their days. And yet Jesus says, the sower goes out to sow. I, I want you guys to be sowers too. I want to be a sower. It is, I believe, every Christian's opportunity and blessing that when we are born into the kingdom of God, we are born as missionaries, as people who are able to share, if nothing else, what God has done in our own lives. And this, friends, can be very, very exciting, especially when somebody actually listens. It can be very, very exciting. But, you know, even Jesus, even Jesus didn't always find good soil to put the seed in. And, and so he, he had ex expressed that there were at least in this example, four different soils. And so we're going to, we're going to see this third element was the soil. So you've got the seed, you've got the sower, and then you've got the soil. And the soil, there's a couple different times or kinds that we're going to look at. So if you look at verse 15 with me, we'll read that. It says, and these are they by the wayside where the word is sown. But when they have heard it, Satan comes immediately and he takes away the word that is sown in their hearts. Just recently, uh, you understand, I'm probably going to reference this a lot because it's what's going on in our lives right now. We just moved into a house and... Part of that, and it happens a lot around here, right? We have septic systems. I have never had a septic system before. I've only been connected to city water because I'm a city boy, right? Now I live in the country and I've got a septic system. And you're not supposed to have anything really with roots, big roots growing over the top of the septic system. And so right before uh, we bought the house, it had some blackberries on there and they had to clear it as part of the agreement. And so they cleared all these blackberries. But do you know when a lot of times when people clear blackberries, they don't do such a good job. And so they cleared these blackberries the best they could and it looked okay. Uh, but then if you don't do anything else, what is going to show up in just a short little amount of time? Blackberries. More blackberries. It's a gift that keeps giving, right? <laughs> so I went out and I was told that maybe it would be a good idea if you planted some grass on there so they could maybe smother the blackberries. I don't know. I did it anyway, if you're <laughs> frowning at me. But whatever the case is, nothing's going to help with the blackberries, huh? Okay, well, just you can encourage me later. So I planted, so I, I went out and I broadcast some, some grass seed. Okay? You can all tell me what I did wrong later. But the birds 
basically ate half of the seed. <laughs> I, I went out the next morning and there was a flock of birds on the septic field. And I'm going, get away from my seeds. <laughs> it's not gonna work. And I was, I, you know what, it was okay. In the end, it's gonna be all right, whatever the case may be. But I witnessed this happening. Because many of while well, I had I had kind of raked them in a little bit, you're not supposed to put grass seed too deep, and so many of them were still on the, on kind of the surface. And you know, birds love seeds, and so they just came and ate up as many seeds as they possibly could. Jesus says this is what happened with the people with the path, it, it, the, the the people that were like the path of the wayside hearers, are, they they only receive it just barely. It just barely hits them. And then before they even have an opportunity for it to get anywhere deep into their heart, Satan comes along and cheep, 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 right? <laughs> Eats it up. And it's gone. And, and I wondered, do you know, I don't think it's, it's not because these people are dull that they can't understand it. It's because it, it just hits them in a very surface way. They're not meditating on the word of God. They're not allowing it to get down deep. It just stays on the very, very surface. So much so, in fact, it, it, maybe you could look at this as the in one ear, out the other ear kind of thing. The, the, the fact that we're so distracted nowadays that God's truth comes into our ear, and then what happens? Ding! Oh, I got to check that. And something I can't even bother to spend five minutes dwelling on, on what was just shared, right? In fact, this, I, I'm not saying this in a mean way. I'm just saying this in a way that I've observed and I've been a part of fully, uh, just, I'm just being transparent. I'll sit in church and I'll listen to a sermon and the word of God is being preached. And the second I'm out the door, it's gone. <laughs> and I wonder, man, now I wonder, because this happened to me a lot when I was younger. Was, was Satan just coming in and swooped, chomping up that, the word of God right out of my life? Is he just distracting me? Is that why he tries to distract us so much? So that the word of God can't make its way into our heart? Friends, I think this is a very, very important idea for us. It's not that, it's not that we are incapable of understanding. It's that we don't... <laughs> We don't meditate on the word of God often. At least I have fallen prey to this. Satan likes to keep us very distracted. And there was another thought there that I, I thought was very important because I have, again, I've been guilty of this. I'm just being fully transparent. And I'm not saying this so that you won't criticize my sermons, just so you know, okay? But this is also important for me. And if you're a parent, this, I, this just, just listen up for just a moment. It's really important. So this is also from Christ's Object Lessons. It says, many who profess to be Christians can aid the tempter to catch away the seeds of truth from other hearts. Many who listen to the preaching of the word of God make it the subject of criticism at home. They sit in judgment on the sermon as they would on the words of a lecturer or a political speaker. And the message that should be regarded as the word of the Lord to them is dwelt upon with trifling or sarcastic comments. The minister's character and motives and actions and the conduct of fellow members of the church is freely discussed. And severe judgment is pronounced. Gossip or slander is repeated. And this in the hearing of the unconverted children. They've not yet fully accepted everything. They don't understand the discussion that's happening and it continues, and it says this, often these things are spoken by parents in the hearing of their own children, thus are destroyed respect for God's messengers and reverence for their message. And many are taught to lightly regard God's word. That is a very important thought for me, because I often, in the past, I've tried to remedy this in myself at least, and it helps when you're the one doing a lot of the preaching, but I try not to, when I hear a sermon, to just analyze it based on whether or not it was a good sermon. Uh, did, he, did he have all his points in order? Did he have all, his, and I'm not saying, look, I'm not saying you shouldn't consider these things. I am just saying, 
it's, it's important nonetheless to be careful about how we do these things and to know, especially when we have young ones, how we are discussing these things around them. I have seen this happen where, and this unfortunately, um, I guess I don't have to give any names or anything, but a good friend of mine growing up had a, a father who was an elder in the church. He was a very critical person. And as they went home after church, it was not the word of God that was being dwelt upon. It was criticism of every single thing that could have been criticized. And I often was with them during this. And you know what it made me think? And it made my friend think, who has now left the church? Huh. Maybe, maybe there's not much to that. And maybe the word of God should not be, maybe they didn't know what they were talking about. I'm not saying there's never a place for questioning somebody. I'm not saying, you know, that's not important. Just be careful and know that, that when you do it, especially around young ears, they may not always understand your concerns. That's a good thought because we don't want our children to lightly regard the word of God. We don't want them to become, as it were, the wayside hearers. Now, there is hope for the wayside. What do you think the hope is for the wayside? It's hard, and it, the seed just sticks on top. It doesn't go in. So what do you got to do to that soil? And now, what did our verse in Hosea said? It was read to us. It said, break up the fallow ground. It's time to seek the Lord. Break it up. Now, this is all good and well to talk about, except when you're the soil. It's not always fun when you're the soil, and you think, about oh, what does that mean to break up the soil? It, let the plow of repentance come down deep into that soil. Let the Holy Spirit speak to your heart and turn you away from that way. And as that happens, do you know, you ever, I don't know if you watched this, it's done. I was just, uh, I was watching some video today, uh, not today, sorry. When was it? It was Wednesday. About a guy who wants to resurface his road. I guess you couldn't figure out why I would be watching a video like that, right? Anyway, he had, he had a, a, a box scraper behind his tractor. Now, the box scraper doesn't do any good unless there's something in, that's also a part of the box scraper. It's these great big old teeth that go in before the box scraper. And guess what they do? They break up the ground, and then the box scraper comes along and tries to level behind it. Now, if you wanted soil to be changed from this hard, wayside, path-like soil, the only way it's going to happen is if you put a plow in it and if you break it up. But the good news is this is exactly what the Holy Spirit's job is to do. He comes alongside us and he convicts us of, of sin and of righteousness and of judgment to come. And he tells us these things, not because he wants to, to make us necessarily just feel guilty, but because he wants us to point us to Jesus, go to him, find salvation and life in Jesus. This is what he's wanting us to do. He wants us to become good soil so that the seed of the word of God gets planted in our hearts and springs up into fruit, some 30, some 60, some 100 fold, so that when the reaping happens, he gets, he gets us. That's what he wants. It's so exciting that the wayside soil doesn't have to just stay that way. There's another kind of soil as well that needs the plow, and that's the next one. Stony soil. We're going to read about it here in verse 16. Let's read that um, 16 and 17. It says this here. And these are they likewise which have sown on stony ground, who, when they've heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness. But they have no root in themselves, and so endure but for a time afterward, when affliction or persecution arises then, for the word's sake, they are offended. This is a, another very interesting group of people who seem to have sort of a superficial um, experience with the word of God. It, it does actually spring up and they look like they've accepted the word of God. And yet it has, where is the root? It's not very deep. It hasn't gone down 
and where the nutrients and the moisture can be found. It's all on the top there. And so the trials of life come along. The sun beats down. And that plant that looks so promising wilts and it dies. Now, it's true that the, the word of God brings life, doesn't it? And yet it is also true that the word of God brings transformation. And as you are transformed, other people will see your transformation. They, they can't help it. And they'll look at your life. And maybe you grew up that way, and so it wasn't as obvious that you transformed, but you, off, you look a little different. You act a little different. Maybe even you eat a little different. I don't know. There are all kinds of things that are different about you. And people in the world, maybe friends or coworkers or, or maybe classmates or somebody, what in the world is going on with you? This used to happen to me in the lunchroom at work all the time. <laughs> I happened to change uh, the way I was eating. Uh, I'll tell you that story another time. It wasn't holy for spiritual reasons initially. But people like to poke right? And in the lunchroom there, even at the hospital, where I thought we were all about health, right? Yet here they were, they didn't, they didn't appreciate my vegetarian lunch. You know, it was like I was back in the 80s, in the, was it a Wendy's commercial? And they'd say, well, where's the beef, right? It was, it was this odd thing that was happening, where I was almost, it, I wouldn't go so far to say I was being persecuted for my lunch. It was very light if it was, in fact, persecution. It was just kind of poking. But, you know, many of you even have experienced things more than just poking. You know, maybe family members, if you didn't grow up as a Seventh-day Adventist Christian, maybe now they look at you and they say, what in the world are you doing? <laughs> this is awfully odd. You, you changed. And persecution begins to come up. Now, if the word has gone down deep, then the sun doesn't hurt. This is a very interesting thought. You see, the same sun beats down on these two different people. One is the stony ground here, and one is the good soil here. One, the word of God has gone down deep into the heart, and when the sun, the trials of life beat down on them, what happens to this plant that has good soil? It actually grows. It flourishes. Yet the, the person who is, has just a surface experience, I don't believe it's the speed at which they accepted it. Sometimes people are worried about, oh, they, they just barely started in this walk with Jesus. Maybe they, you got to be careful about them. The fire will die out. It better not. Don't let the fire die out. It's not supposed to. And yet it's not the speed at which they enter into the relationship. It's the casual nature with which they enter into it. There is in this uh, at least in the Western world, very little persecution that you face when you say and you proclaim, I'm a Christian. It's just not, it's not often. I mean, I suppose there are, maybe, and maybe it's getting worse now, but for a time, it wasn't so bad. And yet, when we were missionaries in China in 2011, we met a lady who, uh, I didn't know a lot of Chinese names there. They all tried to tell me their English names, and she didn't have an English name, so she became Rock's mom because her son's name was Rock, <laughs> like the rock, <laughs> he was just rock. And Rock's mom had received the word of God in her heart, but she was not a shallow ground here. I just always think about her when I, when I see this comparison. She had, she had expressed an interest in, to her husband in becoming a Christian and getting baptized. And maybe I've already even told you this story, but he said, if you do that, I'm going to kill you. This is insane. The sun was beating down. But the, the word of God had gone down deep. And she got baptized. And he did beat her with a hammer. She lived, though, by the grace of God. And she and her son were living at the church that we were helping. And so were about 30 other people who had been completely kicked out of their families because they had accepted Jesus into their heart. The word of God had gone down deep. And when the sun beat down, they didn't 
give up. You know, this is something I wonder sometimes about myself just a little bit. Which one am I more like? And I'll tell you just a little secret here as we're only halfway through the soils. We're getting, we're going to keep going there. But the, do you know, I have found myself in each one of these categories at different points in my life. In fact, I probably tell you that there are points in, in a week where I found myself in each one of these categories where I just didn't have the time for it. And so it just, and then another time when I, oh yeah, that's very nice. That's very nice. So I never heard it presented quite like that before. That's very nice. But then it just, it, it went away. The idea is, we don't want to just be like these other soils. We're going to talk about one more. That's the most common one. That's the not so good soil before we get to the good soil. But the idea is we all want God to come into our lives and to break up the fallow ground so that we can become good soil. That's the same thing that needs to happen with the stony ground here. And by the way, the stone's got to go too, right? <laughs> I mean, that's something. Did somebody say Washington's good at creating stony soil? <laughs> so we've all got work cut out, right? As we're actual gardeners. But God also has his work cut out to, to transform us. But that's what he's in the business of doing. Hallelujah for that. Now, there is a third soil that uh, we need to amend and work on. And that is our last one here, which is the thorny ground. And that is in verse 18 and 19. Here's what it says. These are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word, and the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the lusts of other things entering in begin to choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. Now, it's interesting. It doesn't say it goes away. It doesn't even say it dies. It just says it's unfruitful. It doesn't actually produce anything that it's supposed to produce. And I am finding this out, that thorns are my enemy. Because I told you I have a BlackBerry issue, <laughs> right? And I didn't know before I moved to Washington that these things basically will grow anywhere with a little, very little help. The only reason they're not growing in one place is probably because Scotch Broom is there, <laughs> right? And so... These blackberry thorns, though, are much more insidious in my mind than the scotch broom. I know the scotch broom, they proliferate quite a lot. But have you ever tried to pull out a mature blackberry vine? You should try it someday. There are spe Come to my house and try it. It is incredibly uh, spiritually uplifting. <laughs> Yeah, right? I know this is how I sell you guys coming to my house and helping me with my blackberries. So, but here's what happens. If you were to just cut the top off, it's going to come right back. If you do not get down deep into that soil, and I am telling you, I pulled out, I pulled out roots that were 15 and 20 feet long, some of them. I pulled out roots that looked like a club. I did. I'm, I'm looking, I thought this was a vine. I thought it produced these luscious little berries. No, it is a production of Satan. <laughs> I, I do want some of the berries though, but I just want to get them off of my property. And it is so interesting then that this is exactly like sin in our lives many times. You, you could try it on your own. To chop it off, right? You try. What's going to happen? You'll see it again soon, right? What's the only way it's really going to be gone? Is if, is if the Holy Spirit goes down deep into your life and gets to plow really in there and, get, oh man, I'm, I'm hooked on a, like a three inch giant 15 foot long root. You think the Holy Spirit is powerful enough to pull out the roots? He is. He is. And it is only by God's grace that this sanctification of our lives ever happens. By the way, if you read the Bible, and it, it tells you that God is the one who will do that work to sanctify you, do not then say, God, I got this. Let me take care of this one, okay? 
Because then, you know what you're going to do? I've, I did this. I did this. I, some really big, and, and this, oh, that one looks pretty easy. And I walked up casually. I got this. And it just, the thing is stubborn. And it just is, but the Holy Spirit is never going to be overpowered in that way. If we will only submit our lives to him, he will do a work in our lives that we are totally incapable of doing on our own. Now, good news, again, is that Jesus even gives us more specifics in the thorny soil to help us to understand this. And so I want, you, I want us to look at these areas that actually, that actually uh, cause the problems, the thorns, right? Specifically in Mark, it was recorded that he mentions the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the lusts of other things. They choke out the word, the spiritual seed begins to die or just become unproductive. And basically, we're in a, a load of trouble. And yet, isn't it wonderful that in the Bible, in the word of God, he addresses each one of these things? So just briefly here, the cares of this life. What does Peter tell us to do with the cares of this life? He says, cast your cares upon him, for he cares for you. You are not meant to bear your burdens alone. In fact, in the book of Galatians, Paul says that we should help one another, bear one another's burdens. But even that, we can't do on our own. Christ must be the one who we cast our, our burdens at his feet, and we say, God, I can't handle this on my own. Please help me. Will he turn away one person who comes to him in this way? Never. He will welcome you and he'll say, oh, my child, let me take your burden upon myself. You take my yoke upon you. It's easy and my burden is light. I'll, go, I'll handle this. One of my favorite uh, books to listen to with the kids is Pilgrim's Progress. And, you know, he has this burden that he walks with. And the burden is basically a knowledge of his sin, but he gets to the cross and he sees what Jesus has done on his behalf. And the burden rolls away. And it goes into the sepulcher. And it's gone. Don't, don't bur try and bear your burdens on your own. It also says that the uh, deceitfulness of riches can be like thorns. But Jesus had already told us to store up for yourself treasures. Where? In heaven where moth and rust can't destroy, nor thieves break in and steal. So our priority in this life is not to build up a big bank account. Now, I'm not saying you're a bad person if you have a big bank account. God bless you. God gave it to you for a reason so that you can use that to sow the word of God all over the place, right? I mean, I, it, there, I think there is a reason why, in particular, America has been so prosperous. Where did the vast majority of missionaries come from for such a huge period of time and support of the mission efforts. It was from these very prosperous lands. And yet the, the money that we, that we earn or make, the money that God gives us a strength to make even, as Deuteronomy chapter 8 tells us, is not to be used for ourselves. It is instead to be applied to sowing more seed, <laughs> Right? This is, in, this is absolutely what God has called us to do. Because if we begin to turn it inward, what does Jesus say? It's, a, it's, it's deceitful. It begins, it begins to choke out the word of God in our lives. And, and it doesn't flourish. And the things that once were interesting, the word of God that I once loved, now becomes to me... Not as interesting. Now maybe I'd rather have some little berries, and I'll accept the thorns. But friends, it's deceitful, <laughs> right? Get rid of the bush. <laughs> By the grace of God, let it be pulled out. There's one more thing there that was going to choke out the word of God, and that was the lust of other things. And in Romans chapter 13 and verse 14, it says, Put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. The, the, those pleasures of life, those things that... Now look, I'm not saying life should not be pleasurable. I'm not saying that you shouldn't even maybe have uh, things that are, are good, right? You don't have to live the ascetic monk life 
in order to claim that you are somehow a good Christian. Right? What you need to do is you need to be connected to Jesus. And then when he puts those good things in your life, you won't get your priorities mixed up. But be ever so careful to not make excuses for all of these things, saying that they are, oh, but they're good things. God gave me these things. Because it's altogether possible that they can work their way in around the word of God, which is this wonderful plant meant to bear fruit, and begin to ever, so imperceptibly even, choke out this plant that must flourish in your heart. That's what God wants for you, is the word of God to go down deep. And I believe that this is all about prioritization. God's got to be number one in your life. And when he's number one in your life and you have money and things and whatever, guess what? Who are you going to go to to figure out what to do with that stuff? You're going to go to him and you're going to say, God, all that I have is yours. What shall I do with it? I mean, this is, this is something that's very exciting. Can you imagine being a coworker with God? Where he gives you means and you work together with him to sow the seeds of God's word and people are experiencing salvation in Jesus Christ as a result of this co-working effort. I mean, it's amazing. It's truly amazing. And then there is the last soil. The one that we all hope describes us. The good ground. And I want us to look there, I guess, at Luke chapter 8, just for a moment, and see the parallel tack, uh, text here. Parallel text here in Luke chapter 8 and verse 15. Luke chapter 8 and verse 15. I want you to see how he describes this good ground. Here's what it says. Uh, but that on the good ground are they which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it. And bring forth fruit with patience. Did you hear the description of the good ground? An honest heart. A good heart. Let me ask you a couple things about your heart just for a moment. Do you naturally have a good heart? There is nothing good in me save that which God has done or given. <laughs> I can freely say that. So this is somebody who God is working on them. The Holy Spirit is already at work before the word of God is even sown necessarily. He is imperceptibly even as it were working on their heart. But then there's something that describes these people that's very important. Did you hear it? They're honest. Why is honesty so important in this, in this scenario of these four soils? Why does honesty make one good soil and the lack of honesty put you potentially in one of these other three categories? I, I believe it is possible that if you were to truly be honest with yourself, you would see where you're at. And the Holy Spirit would be able to get the plow in the earth. If instead we are not honest with ourselves and we say things like, it's fine. Fine. I'm, oh, don't do this. If anybody ever asks you, I know, I know we, well, I know why we do it. Somebody says, how are you? And you've all heard it. What do they say? What do you say? What have I said? I'm good. Fine. And what percentage of the time is that actually true? <laughs> what percentage of the time are, are you actually just uh, great? I'm good. And what percentage of the time have you gone through something difficult and you just don't want to be vulnerable and honest at the moment? It's hard to be vulnerable like that. I, I would just challenge you especially if somebody in our church family who, who loves you and who wants to help you says, how are you? Be honest. I'm struggling. 
I haven't had much time for devotional life lately. It feels like everything's in one ear and out the other ear. And you know, if they were just asking as a nicety, they're going to have to take a moment to digest what you've just said. That's okay. Don't, don't, be, don't be upset. Don't think that, you know, they're going to judge you or anything like that. Because remember, we're on the covenant model here, right? Instead, just have an honest conversation. You know what's great, too? If you're the person that asks and somebody is truly vulnerable with you, you know what you could do right at that moment? Say, hey, thanks for sharing that with me. Would you like to pray about that? Let's pray together. Those are some of the most encouraging moments in my life. When I have been vulnerable with somebody and I did not get a eek. <laughs> wow, man, pastor's messed up. <laughs> I didn't get that. I got a, man, let's pray together. Let's pray together. Because to be perfectly honest, if somebody shares with you, that they are experiencing a moment in life where they find themselves in one of the other soils. I had a terrible fight with my spouse and the cares of life feel like they're choking my spiritual life. Somebody shares that with you and you pray. This is one of the most encouraging things that has ever, I've ever experienced. So please do, do, do that with one another. Be vulnerable. Be open. Be honest. Be honest with yourself first and foremost. But that other person, as nice as that is, they can't help you, can they? Not really, truly. Not, not except to point you to the one who actually can break up the fallow ground. It's time to seek the Lord, is what Hosea says. It's not, it's not enough to just notice or to even share and say, I'm experiencing something here. You can't do anything about it. If you come to me, I am going to say, thank you for being vulnerable. Our relationship grows through being vulnerable and through, through that sort of thing. And yet, I can't fix that for you, but I know somebody who can help. Let's go to Jesus. Let's go to Jesus together. Right now, in fact, it'd be okay. Not, I, I also uh, made a deal with myself. I'm going to try and do this too. You guys could make this deal with yourself if you'd like to, too, if you're comfortable with that. When somebody says something like something difficult, or even maybe they ask for that, and you, you're tempted to say, I'll pray for you. Do you know what you should do right then? You can pray with them. <laughs> Don't say, I will pray for you. Say, may, we, may I pray with you <laughs> about that? And then just pray with them right there. Wherever you are, you're in Walmart, pray with them, right? You're at church, pray with them. You're over the phone. Oh, man, I'm sorry you're going through that. May I pray with you right now? Too often, I have said, hopefully this is in the past, I have said, I'll pray for you. And then guess what happens? The cares of this life come up and begin to choke that, that good intention to pr that I had to pray for that person. And I forget. Friends, do it right then. <laughs> right there when, when Christ has a moment in your, in your heart, he inspires you to say, let's pray together. Just be brave and say, let's pray together. Let's pray together. This is really very exciting. And I believe that, that this is what good ground people end up doing. And the way that we end up being good ground people is, again, when the plow comes through and prepares the soil and breaks up the fallow ground, when the Holy Spirit does a work of repentance in your life. You know, in the book of Romans, it says that repentance is a gift of God, even. And yet even gifts, gifts are received, aren't they? And so if you want to be a good soil hearer, invite the Holy Spirit to speak to you. Is he ever going to say, Ah, I'm not going to talk to you. No. He's going to come to you personally, and he's going to speak to you and help you to know what's going on, how he can help, the love that he has for you. Friends, this is our desire. Only do not resist the Holy Spirit's work in our lives. So what, 
What do you say today? If I were to ask you, and I'm not asking out loud, but rhetorically so, what soil do you most kind of gravitate towards today? Which one do you think most describes you? Which one do you want to describe you? Do you want to be the good soil here? I think you, you must. You're here. You're, you're, you're attending via Zoom or in person. And you're coming because you want to hear the word of God. And you want it to go down deep and spring up and bear fruit. Isn't that why we're here? To worship God? To receive his word into our hearts? To encourage one another? Isn't that why we're here? Father in heaven, we're so grateful that we can be here uh, to worship you and to look into your word. We are praying, Lord, that um, your word would find a place deep in our heart to lodge and to grow into a fruitful plant. Father, while, while Jesus was here, we understand that he watered the crop with his tears and even with his blood. May it not prove useless in our lives. Lord, if we, if we find ourselves more in the place of one of these other unproductive soils, then I, I pray, Lord, that you would send your Holy Spirit in a special way to us to break up the fallow ground, Lord. M may, we, may we ripen and increase as the word of God finds a place in our lives. Father, we don't, want, we don't want to go on in that way. And we can't do this on our own. So we are imploring you. We are presenting before you our great need and praying that you would do what only you can in helping us in this, in this matter, Father. We thank you for hearing our prayer. We ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen.